So you wanted to start a distillery. Well, behind me in the middle of uh, the Gold Coast uh, in suburbia is in actual fact a licensed distillery. My name is Nick and welcome to Distilling in Australia. So today what I'm going to do is take you through the chronological steps of how you probably should uh, set up a licensed distillery if that's the way you want to go uh, and uh, learn from the mistakes that I have made uh, in relation to uh, getting uh, the whole process in the right order. So uh, join me, I'm going to divide this up into a number of chapters and basically give you an overview of the process to become a licensed distiller. I hope you enjoy it. All right, well, here we are. We're now inside the distillery and this is a fully licensed and compliant distillery. Um, uh, it has a federal license, it has a state license, and it's also uh, approved by local council. So they're the main things. Now, before we get started on this, the one thing I do want to make really clear right at the very beginning is that I'm not making myself out to be any guru. There is any number of people out there who are way more qualified than me in relation to setting up a distillery. So as always, here is five seconds of your life that you'll never get back. All right, now having said that, I have gone through the process. I did the whole process myself and I did manage to achieve the licenses. So I'm gonna divide this up into, as I said earlier, a number of different chapters and the first chapter we're going to go through is it's all about you. Now, what I mean by that is that before you even start this process, there's a couple of things that you need to know that is crucial to the success or otherwise of your application. The first one is that you cannot be an undischarged bankrupt. Now, both the federal government and the state government have uh, a test of what they call a uh, fit and proper person. So if you are currently a bankrupt, you fall outside that definition of a fit and proper person because in reality, a lot of what we do is based on trust. And yes, you know, they will come and audit you from time to time and that sort of stuff if, if what you're doing brings attention to yourself. But in reality, most of what we do is on trust. So, you know, the state government, the federal government and local government are putting trust in us that we will do the right thing. And so therefore there's a fit and proper person test. So that's the biggie. So if you're undischarged bankrupt, don't even start the process because you won't get anywhere. Other thing is criminal history. So they do national police checks, sorry, they do national police checks at every stage. So when you get your federal license, your state license, they would all do national police checks on you. But not only you, anyone associated with the business as well. So if you have a criminal history, that is probably going to be something that you really need to look at in detail uh, and get some advice on whether or not that's going to impede uh, your ability to, to get the licenses. So they're the first two big things you need to worry about, about you. Okay, are you what they refer to as a fit and proper person? That's the start. All right, so now into the second stage. So we've done the uh, it's about you. So now we're going to do local council. Okay, now there's many 500 and something local councils around Australia. They all have their different ideas and different requirements. What is important to understand is that Councillors are human beings and they come with their own preconceived ideas about what distilling is and looks like. Now, the main factors from my experience is that they're looking at two issues, safety and quiet enjoyment, right? So if you want to set up a nano distillery like this one is, uh, there are two issues that you need to, to sort of address. So. What I would suggest is that at the very beginning, you get in touch with your local councillor and go and sit down with him and say, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to do it. And that's important, okay? Because that's the, the, the core of, of the issue. Uh, and, so, and get a reaction from the local councillor because what happens is in through, through this process, 
if the local councillor objects to you doing this, you've got next to no chance of getting it through. All right, so you can go through the whole process and then right at the very end when you're relying on that liquor license from your um, state government uh, and it goes to the local council and he says, no, nope, not going to sign off on it. Or you've done all that work, all that effort for nothing. So be prepared to answer the questions that your local councillor might have. And look, I've had reports from different councils uh, some of them are really open to the idea. Some of them absolutely will not entertain it at all. So that is your first port of call when it comes to um, the statutory requirements um, in relation to getting your license. So go and see your counsellor, introduce yourself, sit down with them, say, hey, you know, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to do it. How do you feel about that? Because at the end of the day, that's, that's going to be the make or break for you. All right. So that would be the first step. Now, I didn't do it that way. And believe me, I sweated on it for two, three months going through the final process uh, where I could have bypassed that by just going and seeing my counsellor at the very beginning and saying, well, you know, this is what I'm going to do. It is safe. You know, I'm not going to create a, an environment where you know, I'm going to blow up the neighbourhood or anything like that. They need to understand the process of, of what you're going to be doing. Uh, so that's, that's the first step. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the ATO licence. Now the ATO licence is in actual fact quite straightforward. And yes, I know there's a couple of questions in the um, application form that uh, is... Uh, are a bit tricky, but my suggestion to you is don't try and do the document as a whole. Break it, break it down into each question and just attack one question at a time and work through it and, and you'll be fine. The thing with the ATO is that if, you, if it's going to be a hobby, no chance. Okay, The ATO's attitude is that it's getting close to saturation and therefore they're only interested in giving licences to people who are actually wanting to set up a bona fide business. So that's business names, that's trademarks, that's a business plan. Now don't get too over the top with your business plan. Your business plan for the ATO is not a bank loan application. It is an application to show the ATO of how you plan to transition from the very beginning to you know, a five-year plan as to where you're going to go and how you're going to take the business. All right? So at the end of the day, all the ATO is really interested in is collecting their excise tax when, it, when, it's, uh, when it's available to them. So that's, that's a big one. Just be careful of that. You know, don't go too over the top with, with the questions and answers. Just keep it brief, to the point. So once you've received your... Um, manufacturer's uh, license uh, to uh, uh, produce an excisable uh, produce, uh, that's, the first, that's the first license that you, you must have. So the next one you go to then is, of course, your um, local government, so not local government, your state government liquor license. All right? So there's no point um, having uh, your license to manufacture and not being able to sell it. So you need to go to the state government. So again, the state government application is quite straightforward. Uh, in uh, Queensland, we have what's called an artisan's producer's license, which is what I have. Um, so it's still commercial license artisan, which allows me to sell my products off-site. Okay, so this distillery is actually closed to the public. So there's no point coming to visit me because you, you, you can't, all right? So um, what, I, what I am doing is I am uh, going to be selling my produce at promotional events and online, which is what my license entitles me to do. Uh, so that's something that um, in part one, uh, in relation to, sorry, part two in relation to the local government, you need to then stipulate those sorts of things. So in 
one of the requirements for your Queensland, or sorry, not Queensland, but one of the requirements for your liquor license is that you've got to demonstrate that you're not going to be have an impact on your local area. So they have what's called in Queensland a risk assessment management plan or ramp. Uh, and as an artist and producer, uh, if you're in Queensland, you still must produce a ramp uh, if you're going to be um, going for an artisan's license. Uh, artisan's license is not considered to be low risk uh, by, by the liquor, Queensland Liquor Commission. And I'm assuming it will be a similar situation in other states as well. But uh, a ramp is basically just a, a document that shows you or called known as a risk assessment management plan and it's just a way of you documenting how you're going to manage risk to yourself, the public that come to frequent you and the general community around you. So uh, it's an important document and it forms part of your license. Uh, a lot of the other things you can apply for exemptions like uh, advertising for argument's sake, if uh, uh, community impact statement or CIS, uh, those sorts of things you can apply for an exemption if you can prove that your, your application doesn't uh, create uh, an impact to um, your uh, local area. Uh, and uh, doesn't require advertising because you're not going to have impact on, on your local area. So these are there's, there are all those sorts of issues that you can go through and get exemptions for, and I have covered them in other in other videos as well. All right. So so far about you, ATO license, liquor license. That's your licenses. So what's the risks? Because that's important. Okay. The way I see it, and again, remember I've said I'm no guru here, but the way I see it is there's, there's two major risks, okay? The first is saturation point. In other words, everyone sees this as a, an easy and quick way to make lots of money and, and look, you know, I've spoken to people and, you know, their, their, their mindset is uh, I'm going to open a distillery, I'm going to have my own brand, I'm going to have you know, this fantastic product that I'm going to put out into the world and Margot Robbie is going to embrace it and all of a sudden, you know, I'm going to sell it to some big conglomerate for three, four hundred million dollars. I've heard it. Okay, I've heard it several times. Now, the reality is that most of us will do relatively small volumes with relatively low profit margins and I think that's pretty well the truth of the matter. So the risks I see is that trying to start too big, trying to, oh sorry not trying to but borrowing money um, to uh, set yourself up. Uh, at the moment we have a $350,000 excise rebate in place which I've discussed previously, there is no guarantee that that is going to stay in place. Okay, the federal government in its next budget, you know, Labor government's now in, they could turn around and say, you know what, we don't want to give this rebate anymore. And they could take it away from us. Now, that 350,000 rebate for many distilleries is the difference between viable and not viable. And that's just the reality of it. So I don't think for one second that that's there forever. And also remember that in a couple of days' time, the 1st of August, the excise rebate goes up to about $94 a litre, which means that out of a 750 mil 40% ABV bottle, a 40% ABV bottle of uh, spirits, yeah, around about $28 of that is tax. Then you've got GST on top of that. So if you sell it for $66, there's another $6. So of your $66, you've got $34 in just taxes. That's before you've done anything else. So just keep that in mind that there's, there's no guarantees that any of these programs are going to be here forever. All right? So my suggestion is that you start small. You have small... Uh, expectations and you can then 
build it up over a number of years. Think of it as a marathon, but not a one marathon. It's probably going to be three or four marathons, uh, you know, back to back. So, you know, it's not something that you're going to be uh, more than likely going to be turning into an overnight success. Now, as I've made it quite clear, my ambition here is to produce uh, 100 liter, oh, sorry, 100 bottles a week. That's it. That's my. That's what I am trying to do here in this particular uh, distillery. And given the size I have, and given the power resources I have, that is going to be my limit. Okay. So to do that with my still, which I'll get to in a minute, yeah, you know, I have to run. I'll have to run that three times a week, and possibly four times a week, to to reach that level. All right. So yeah, you know, that's that's. Um, that's a full-time job uh, to, to reach those levels. So, so they're the issues that I see. Uh, and I think it's important to, to just put it out there that you know, this is not a get-rich-quick scheme. You do it because you're interested in it. You do it because you love it. You do it because you want to actually produce something. Uh, you know, it, 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 there's any number of reasons why you do it, but... Uh, get rich quick? No. No. You'd have to be extraordinarily lucky to, to uh, achieve that. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to talk about opportunities. Now, in the threats or part of it, I went over the fact that, you know, debt and all the rest of it, but there are opportunities. Now, the way I see it is that a small number of these distilleries are going to be exceptionally um, successful, all right? And hey, I, I mean, hopefully I am, but I'm not banking on that. So you gotta say, okay, so where is the opportunity for the other 90%, which is roughly how it works out. About 10% of us will actually do really well. So out of the, let's call it 400 licensed distilleries, you know, 40 will do really well and 360 will struggle along. All right? Now, for whatever reason, for whatever scale they may be at, but you know, there'll be, there'll be you know, 90% of us that will just you know, bobble along and, and some of us will go broke. That's the reality. Now, the opportunity that I see is that Currently, with that 350,000 um, government rebate, every distillery has that credit. So, if you're a small distillery and all of a sudden you uh, end up with uh, some movie star, you know, getting a hold of your product and uh, saying, "Oh, you know, this is really great. I love this," and your sales go through the roof. You have two choices. Your cho first choice is put your prices up and still produce the same amount. Or the other choice is to increase production to cater for the demand that you've all of a sudden been uh, exposed to. Now, the way I see it is that if you invest to cater for that sudden increase, you've got bigger property, you've got bigger equipment, you've got all sorts of uh, overheads and infrastructure and um, management and staff and all these other issues that, that, that come into it uh, for what could be, and I'm saying it will be, but what could be a relatively short-term success. So, my thought process is that if one of those 40 very successful distilleries you know, all of a sudden gets that enormous boost, then a great way to increase your production without increasing your risk and exposure is to manufacture under license. So how that would how I see that working is that you could, you, you would have your formula, you would have your bottles, you'd have your design, yeah, you know, all those sorts of issues. You have 
for that particular product, you'll have your um, recipes and your processes. So you would be able to outsource what you do to other distilleries and you can specify, okay, this is the equipment you've got to have. This is, uh, this is how we ferment, if you are fermenting. Uh, this is how uh, we're going to do our recipe. This is where we're going to buy our neutral grain spirits from, if that's the way you want to do it. You can specify every step of the, of, of the process and then license that out to other distilleries. And the other distilleries can then take advantage of their... 350,000 excise, which at the moment is around about 240 bottles a week, okay? And so they can produce up to that amount of alcohol before they have to start paying excise, and that 340,000, 350,000 um, rebate that they get for the government, well, that's their income. Because if you're a big company and you start producing more than that 240 bottles, then you're starting to pay that excise. And remember, that excise is just temporary. So. These are sort of the, the, the ideas and the risks and, and the lateral thinking that I think would be good for the industry and like you know, join uh, Australian Distillers Association and, and these bodies uh, you know, so you can meet people that are in the same industry. Uh, and I think that's a, to me, like if it happened to me and I all of a sudden was successful uh, and, and had a product that was really well uh, received in the marketplace, that would be more the way that I would go. I would, I would per personally prefer to license out what I'm doing to a number of smaller distilleries, then I'm not exposing myself to a greater risk. And of course, all these distilleries have to be licensed and um, have to have their insurances in place and all those normal sorts of things that, that you have to have. But at least you're spreading the risk and you're receiving a, a percentage of that, uh, that profit uh, where you haven't had to outlay uh, an enormous amount of money to set that up. Okay, equipment. Um, yes, a couple of things about equipment. All right. A lot of this will de depend on, on how you want to operate your distillery. Now, the truth of the matter is that a very large percentage, and you know, I've heard figures up to 90% uh, of distilleries buy in their, what's known as a neutral grain spirit, or NGS. And they buy it in these intermediate bulk containers, okay, which is IBCs, um, which is those white, uh, white uh, containers uh, with the metal, on, metal grid on the outside of them. Uh, they hold a thousand litres. And uh, they'll buy in the, the spirit. There's a couple of major suppliers uh, of that particular spirit, and I'm, there's nothing wrong with it. It's, a, it's very, very high quality, very good spirit. Uh, but the whole process of uh, fermentation for many distilleries is just a step they don't want to take, okay? Because fermentation means equipment, it means time um, and energy, you know? And so they'd rather get the uh, neutral spirit and buy it directly where they can then do their particular uh, recipe with that uh, with that neutral grain spirit and move it on to um, their final product so what I decided to do because my my thought process and right wrong or different again it's just my my opinion is I want to produce my own um, alcohol and I want to distill my own alcohol. So to me, it's a bit of a point of, of difference that my actual uh, alcohol will be unique to my particular distillery. So this is a fermenter. Now, this was a mistake. Now, not a huge mistake. There's nothing wrong with the fermenter, okay? It's actually a really good fermenter, okay? But uh, it's what's known as a uh, double skin fermenter, conical fermenter. Now, for beers, perfect, 
Okay, it's a perfect type of fermenter if you want to uh, do do beers and 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 uh, carbonate the beers uh, and that sort of stuff. But for a distiller, it's a bit of overkill. You don't need a double wall fermenter. Uh, I'm actually in the process of uh, getting a couple of uh, uh, different fermenters uh, made, uh, and just for I suppose interest's sake. Fermenters to me should be in 500 litre increments. Right? And the reason being is that when you go to buy commercial amounts of yeast, they come in half kilo packs. So it, the, the rule of thumb generally is about one gram of yeast per litre of uh, a finished uh, wash or mash, whatever it is that you want to produce. So, um, so if you go to 500 litre, uh, fermenter then you put in half a kilo of yeast so that's a full packet of yeast now when i say 500 liters that's your volume of what you're going to be uh, fermenting but remember you need at least 20 percent more than that uh, for the fermentation so if it's going to be 500 liters you make a 600 liter fermenter if it's going to be a thousand liters you make a 1200 liter fermenter all right because you do need that extra room for the fermentation uh, process especially if you're going to be doing a rum and fermenting something like um, molasses all right because that really reacts and you get a lot of um, a lot of foam and and, and uh, uh, expansion during the uh, fermentation and and you, know, you see it all the time of fermenters puking and you, know, you end up with a bloody great mess everywhere and especially with molasses it's so sticky and revolting it's just a unbelievable um, price uh, un unbelievable product uh, but so that's something that you need to just just be aware of so it makes it easier so my next two fermenters i'm actually getting two fermenters um, made at the moment uh, they're both 600 liter fermenters now why Two, okay. First of all, out of a 500 litre fermenter, if you're operating at a, a SG of about 0.08, you're gonna get around about 10%. So out of 500 litres, you're gonna get about 50 maximum of actual alcohol potential. Now, the reality is that you get about 80% of that. Now, you can argue the point about, you know, oh no, it's gonna be less, it's gonna be more, whatever, but just round about 80%. So out of a 500 litre fermentation, you're gonna end up with about 40 usable litres of, uh, of alcohol. And that then will then give you, or give me, in this particular case, my 100 bottles. Okay, so that's the way I'm doing it. Now, why two fermenters? Well, fermentation at a commercial level takes about five days. All right, so your two fermenters, you've got one fermenting and one you're using. So you use each, you just alternate them. So you've got a constant supply of alcohol by using uh, two fermenters and that's your volumes. All right, so you can expand it or contract it depending on, on, on what it is that you want to do. But just remember that uh, commercial yeasts uh, do come in half kilo packs and actually I'll show you one, I'll grab one out. Okay. So, I'm back, sorry. All right, so, this is a brick uh, of uh, uh, yeast, all right? And this is uh, a 500 grams or half kilo uh, brick of, uh, of, of yeast. This happens to be a uh, rum yeast, um, and uh, this is what I'm gonna be using to, to make my um, rum-based spirits. Uh, and so, vacuum packed, readily available, but again, this whole packet would go into a 500 litre wash for argument's sake. So, uh, hence the reason for the size of these. So this one here was 130 litres, uh, and uh, in hindsight, I should have just gone for uh, the 500 litre, or 600 litre fermenter, so, so I could ferment 500 litre batches, and you can use up a whole brick in, uh, in one session. Uh, then that would give you a week's work. But for me, I was trying to work out whether or not I could do it um, and whether or not I could get a product that was drinkable. 
And so it turns out, it turns out that yes, I can do that. So that was, that was a bit of a bonus. Um, all right, now the other thing, the still. Now this is a, a, a reflux still and it's also a pot still. Uh, so I have attachments here so I can, uh, inside each one of these is a uh, bubble plate. So there's four bubble plates, four stages and a deflagnator here. Uh, this is a manifold that I designed and had made up uh, to uh, control the flow of uh, water through the deflagnator which then controls your head temperature. Uh, so that works very well. Okay, I'm very happy with how it works, but if you're going to be looking at a still, uh, I have actually gone ahead and bought two more stages. So this will now be a six plate um, reflux still. Uh, and then when I'm doing it in pot still mode, I'll remove the plates, have the column to three or maybe four columns, and then take it off as a pot still. Uh, and there's a reason for that in the process when you're producing whatever it is you want to produce. So it depends on, on what you're trying to do. So when I'm putting my wash through here, or in the first instance, if I'm going for a clean spirit, um, I'm going to run the six plates. I'm going to run it um, reasonably slowly because I want to get as pure a product out of here as I possibly can. Now, you'll see a lot of claims about purity when it comes to alcohol production, around about 95% is the maximum you're ever going to get out in terms of, of purity. Around about 95% ethanol is, is the maximum that you, you're going to achieve. Uh, now, at four plates, I'm getting around about 90 to 92% uh, out of these four plates. Uh, and so that's why I've bought the other two plates, because I want to get it up to around about 93, 94%. Uh, so, yeah, a fair bit of cost in those two extra plates, but nevertheless, you know, it's, it's about getting the best possible product you can by having uh, the, the six stages. Now, commercial distilleries will have 10, 20 plates, and they'll have, you know, 12 inch columns and all this, and they're producing massive amounts of alcohol, okay? So, I've got no need for that. Now, this is a 130 litre still, it has uh, 10 kilowatts of power, which is the, the maximum I can run on, uh, on a domestic circuit. Uh, and it runs very well. I would need to run it three or four times a week uh, to produce my 100 litres and that's okay. Okay, I'm happy to do that. Uh, uh, but you know, if you wanted to produce more, obviously you need to increase the size of your still. But remember, if you're going to increase the size, you still keep it in proportion to your fermenter. All right, so you're going to think, okay, well, how many times a week do I want to run the still? Uh, you know, and then remember, you know, by taking say, so well, it's going to take me five days to ferment. If you're going to do fermenting, so yeah, you know, the still size needs to be relative to your fermenter size uh, and how many times a week that you want to run it. Simple as that. Uh, this particular setup is, well, I wouldn't call it commercial because uh, the, the commercial commercial stills, yeah, they start around about a six or eight inch column, okay, because they're, they're really producing a, a, quite a lot of alcohol. Uh, but it's certainly not a home hobbyist either. Uh, so, yeah, this is three millimeter stainless steel, 304 stainless steel. It's a copper. This is copper, uh, solid copper uh, column here. Uh, stainless steel, what uh, sight glasses, all those sorts of things. So uh, it's a heavy duty still, uh, and it and I, I must admit it, it works very well. I'm very happy with it. Uh, so you know, it's not a $99 still from uh, uh, eBay either. It's uh, properly uh, designed and and engineered. So uh, that's in terms of equipment. Yeah, this is probably the starting point, but instead of four four plates, I'd be going for a six plate straight from straight from the gecko. Uh, if if I was going to do this again, okay. Um, storage, stainless steel containers, very important. Okay, so uh, if you want to, uh, you need to be able to store your products so you can um, uh, emulsify whatever it is you're going to add into to what you're doing. 
These are stainless steel, uh, 35 litre stainless steel containers. Now, I went for 35 litres because when I do a run, I can put it into one of these containers. By the time I water it down to 40%, it brings me up to around about 24, 25 litres uh, in that, which weighs, to all intents and purposes, 25 kilograms. And I'm old, so 25 kilograms is as much as I want to lift. All right, so uh, those I can manage quite easily uh, on my own. Uh, and uh, that was my limit. If you get bigger than that, you know, you got to start having lifting equipment and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, it really becomes a very uh, labor intensive uh, process. Uh, so that's to do with that. Uh, but you know, you've got to think about that, your, um, your containers. The other thing is, you know, transfer pumps. Uh, I have a, what's known as a load pump. Uh, that's to transfer thick type things like molasses. Okay, it's ideal for transferring molasses. Uh, make sure that you know, your pumps are, can handle 100 degrees Celsius uh, in terms of temperature. Otherwise, you're waiting around for days for everything to cool down so you can transfer your products around. Um, water grade hoses, uh, heat hoses that can handle the heat as well. You know, all these things are things that you need to consider uh, when putting it together. But the main things is your fermenter, if you're going to ferment, you know, I would say start at 500 litres at least, um, and you're still at least a six plate, six bubble plate reflux still. And if you can, you have one that's interchangeable that you can turn into a pot still as well, which I can do with this one. So, and of course there's thousand different configurations, all right? So you do your own research and work out what it is that you want to do uh, when it comes to uh, the configuration of the, of the still. So look, that's, that's all I wanted to really cover. I'm hopefully I'm going to be cutting. Hopefully this has not gone on too long. Uh, but yeah, that's the big picture overview of uh, setting up a distillery. Uh, just keep in mind that there, there's a lot of distilleries out there. You've got to have a point of difference. Okay, So uh, where that point of difference is, maybe you're really good at marketing. Maybe you uh just have this amazing recipe that uh, uh you know everyone loves uh, i mean it's up to you but you know just just don't go into this thinking that it's all um uh, milk and honey because uh, it's not it's it's hard work and i can assure you in the middle of summer uh when i'm working in the distillery here it's hot it's heavy and it's uh you know a lot of grunt work uh, that goes goes into uh, the process. But anyway, that's it for this video. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, I hope it's given you a bit of an overview of the correct process rather than the way I did it. Um, I sort of did it ass about, but you get that. Uh, I still got the result, uh, but uh, there were some there were some pretty stressful moments there in the approval process. So as always, stay safe, stay legal. Ciao for now. Distilling alcohol is illegal in Australia unless you hold the appropriate licenses and permits. I am not a lawyer and the contents of this video are not intended to be legal advice. Do not rely on any information contained in this video and seek your own legal professional advice before making any decisions. Be aware, the Australian Tax Office and the local law enforcement agencies will be taking interest in this channel due to its content. Please keep this in mind before posting any comments. Any comments posted are the opinion of the person posting and not of this channel. Let's get started.